Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. This is week three, lecture three, and we're going to be talking again about error in measurement, but this time error that comes from the application of linear calibration curves. So you might think when we do a regression and we get the line y is equal to mx plus b, that how we're going to find the error is to realize that both the slope and the intercept have some sort of uncertainty associated with them. And in fact, there are statistical parameters you can extract that give you the slope with its uncertainty and the y-intercept with its uncertainty. But you don't propagate the error in the way I showed you the first week. That's because linear regression is a far more complicated mathematical fitting process. So we can't simply rely on the error in the slope and the intercept to give us the actual error when we use the calibration curves to actually calculate what's in an unknown you need to go a little bit further and be introduced to another set of formulas in order to do this. I won't be deriving these formulas, but I will give you some places to go if you want to read more about where they come from. So one of the key statistical variables we will apply is something called the standard error of the estimate. It's sometimes called the standard error of regression, but standard error of the estimate seems to be the most consistent terminology. It's always written as s sub y slash x. And as you can see here, it's the square root of the value of your calibration at a particular point minus this yi with a little hat over it. So what this is is something called the residual. So when you make a regression line, you have a predicted y value, a y is equal to mx plus b. But your actually measured calibration at a particular x is not exactly equal to your calibration curve usually. There's what's called a residual, and that residual is what gets squared here. So if you have a really bad calibration and your actual y values are very different than your curve, then these residuals will be large, and you're going to have a big s, y, x. So it's a measure of how far off each of your calibration data points is from the line that you predicted. Now this isn't the only variable you'll need, but SYX is absolutely essential because it plugs into the equation that you are going to be using to calculate the error on the predicted concentration or the error on X sub zero. That's simply called S X sub zero is shown here and it's the equation that you see here. It's complicated, but you'll be calculating it a lot and you'll get used to it. So let me go through each of the terms. So obviously you see S Y slash X, which is why that's important. You also see m, which is the slope of the curve. So you've already had to calibrate something before, of course, you can manage the error and describe it. n is the number of calibration samples you took. It actually has nothing to do with your unknown that you're inputting into your regression, or rather, the total number of measurements. So that's 1 over n. Going to a couple of the other terms, y0 is the signal that you measured in your unknown. y bar is simply the average of all of the calibration y values. Then you see m squared on the bottom in this very strange sum of xi minus x bar squared. So in any case, that's a really important term. It's sometimes called SXX. And it's, this, it's a very odd term because it's actually the spread in the x values of your calibration curve. So if you have a really big calibration range from like 0 to a molar, then SXX is going to be a big number. And if it's a very narrow range, it'll be a smaller number. What I realized, because SXX is one of those variables you can't calculate with the online free versions of Excel, is that if you take the standard deviation of your X range in your calibration curve and you square it, you actually get the top value shown here of SXX. And then if you multiply that out by N minus 1, you have a pretty good measure of SXX. So you're usually going to be given SY sub X, or you'll have to calculate it in Excel. And then to get SX, sorry, SYX, and then to get this other one, you're going to use the standard deviation of X. So that's kind of where all these different terms come from. One thing I should point out is sometimes you'll do replicate measurements at your unknown. So say you have an unknown sample of lead. You do one measurement, you get one amp out. You might want to do another measurement, and maybe another and another. So if you do replicate measurements of an unknown, the number of times you do that is called J. And then that shows up here. And instead of a 1 value, which you get if you only take it once, you get a 1 over J. Now, what I want to do is go through, in somewhat gory detail, a single example that doesn't use Excel. 
so you can see how I approach calculating what I call SX0. That formula is really not that hard to do, it just has a lot of moving parts. So hopefully by watching this exercise, you'll have an idea about how to tear it apart. Okay, so let's get started. First off, we know that SX0 is equal to this very large, complicated expression. But you'll see that I gave you SY sub X, and I also gave you, in this case, a standard deviation of the concentrations. So that's going to help you a lot. So this number here is going to be very much related, of course, as I described before, to the standard deviation of the concentration. So this is SXX, and remember we're going to square that standard deviation and multiply it by N minus 1, where N in this case is the total is the total number of measurements. So let me just write that out. Okay, so you can see that I calculated SXX pretty simply. I simply took the standard deviation number, 140 ppm, I squared that, and I multiply it by N minus 1 to get my SXX. So that's pretty straightforward. Okay, the next term we're going to worry about is that top term, Y0 minus Y bar. This is the unknown signal minus the average of the calibration signals squared. So the information we're going to need here is this, there's our Y0, because that's our unknown signal. And we also need the average of the calibration signals. And then that whole difference is squared. And I give this to you here, the average signal was 300 millivolts. So when I went from zero up to wherever I went up to, that was my average signal. So let's calculate that and see how it works out. Okay, and there's the top part of what I call term three. Then finally, I'm gonna go ahead and calculate the whole ball of wax. So how I usually do this is I calculate term three first. And what I mean by term three is all of this. This is called term three, and that's my own nomenclature. And so the first thing we're gonna do is calculate term three, and that's gonna be 62500 millivolts squared divided by the slope quantity squared. And just to point out, there's our slope. Remember, that's the same as the instrument response function. And we're going to multiply that. Remember, we have the SXX on the bottom, too. Now, if you look at your units, you'll notice everything happily cancels. So everything under that square root sign has no units. And I calculate here 0 0.000434 for term 3. And now, when I put it into the big enchilada here, I'm going to be using my SY sub X. Let's see if I can get another color here. We'll use this, it's a little hard to see. That's 120. So there's my 120 for my S sub X, S Y slash X. I'm gonna divide it by my slope of 35, and then I'm gonna multiply it by a big old square root, which is one, plus one over N, which in this case is seven measurements in the calibration, plus my term three, point zero 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 four three four. Now I didn't write the units in here, but realize that the units on SYX are going to be pretty straightforward because they're just going to be millivolts and I'm dividing by an M which is millivolts over PPM. So I'm going to cancel millivolts and end up with PPM. And when I do this, I get 120 millivolts per PPM times what I calculated as the square root 1.07. And so you'll notice that whole square root didn't really do very much to the error but it was really S, Y slash X that controlled it, and there we have it. So the residual, this error, which is remember that residual error divided by M, is kind of a really good approximation in many cases. It's only rare that you really find that the square root term really, really changes the error, but of course to be exact about your error, you wanna to try to do that. Now I'll do some live Excel work in the example section, but just briefly, if you wanted to use Excel to do this, here's what you would do. First off, you don't have to be told what the standard error of the estimate is or what SX is. You can actually ask Excel to calculate both of those. It's kind of cool still to use the standard deviation in your X calibration because you can do that off any Excel sheet. But if you want, you can go look up the SXX statistic and find a way to calculate it. It actually comes from something called the Linest function. Anyhow, to make a long story short, I have a data set. If you're going to calculate the error, it's vital that you had done a couple of things beforehand in Excel. You need to have your slope and your intercept. You need to have figured out 
what the unknown concentration is. So you've got to know x zero. And you need to have calculated the standard deviation of x, of course, because that's going to go into SXX. So here are the steps. You find the SYX statistic, and that's the STEYX function. Then you calculate SXX. I did it here as using the standard deviation squared times n minus 1. I found term 3, just like I did in the last part. And then notice again, it's very small. And then I multiplied everything together to get 2.17. So overall, this was the expression. Once you've done that, the question is, what's actually your error bar? So there's SYX, there's SX, and there's the whole thing. So this brings up a really important point, because we know from week one that if we have a standard error or standard deviation, which SXX is O is kind of that, the question is, how do I report confident limits? How do I use that to make an error bar? And you're going to use the same formula we learned before, but in this case, you've got to think about what's N, and what's degrees of freedom. So let me go through that. So this is the basic structure that we learned in week one. You're going to take the standard deviation of, the, of a method, and SX0 in this case you can think of as a standard deviation or the error of the X0 value. You're going to multiply it by a T value from that table where you're going to look up if you want 95% confidence limit, 95% for your degrees of freedom, and you're going to divide by the square root of n, but there's some weird stuff you have to keep track of. First off, the degrees of freedom track with the input values you use to calculate SX0. So since you got to SX0 from your linear calibration data set, the degrees of freedom has nothing to do with how many times you made the measurement of your unknown. It only has to do with your calibration data set. So DF is the degrees of freedom defined by the number of samples in your calibration. If you went from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 ppm, then you would have 5 and n equal to. What's really important to realize is the n on the bottom is different. If you remember back to the t-test we were doing about the standard error and if something had systematic error or didn't, it's a very similar rule because what's on the bottom, that n actually reflects the measurement of the unknown. So if you only did one measurement of an unknown and got a single signal, then you have an n of 1, and that drops out. If you took multiple signals, then you take the square root of however many you took. And so your number of times that you do replicate measurements both can decrease x sub 0, and it also ends up being part of the error that you report out as a confidence limit. So the last thing I want to leave you with in this lecture is whenever you have an equation, you have to know how to manage it. So you have to be able to do a calculation faced with this equation. And that can be a little bit difficult to track, but if you have Excel, it'll be much easier. But what I want you to reflect on is, at the end of the day, we want to do analysis that has a small value of S sub X zero, right? We want to use our calibration curves and define the values we'll measure with great precision. So it's kind of instructive to look at this equation because it teaches you what knobs you have to control. So obviously, S Y sub X is one of the most important knobs. And if you have a really good fit to your data, meaning those residuals are very, very tiny, SYX is tiny, and overall your error will be small. So of course, you want a really good. However, as you can also see, you can make the square root component of this equation small by, for example, taking replicates. The other thing you can do, some interesting trends, is it's helpful if your signal is actually in the middle of your calibration range. So if y0 minus y bar is 0 or close to it, then that third term drops out completely. The other thing you can do is make SXX very big. If that's very big value, then 1 over a big value is close to 0. There's a really interesting paper I give here that goes through this, and they had a really great proof that you actually optimize your SX0 when J is equal to N. And you really want an N greater than 5 to avoid your T values being too large when you turn them into confidence limit. So I hope from all of that you've gotten a good understanding of how to handle error introduced by the application of a linear regression curve. And an interesting thing is we don't actually combine the error from the replicate measurement of the unknown with the error from the regression. The reason for that is that the formulas I'm showing you assume that the variance of the error is constant for all of the calibration points and the unknown. If for some reason that is not true, so if for some reason the errors that you were getting in your calibration data points were much smaller than the error in your unknown, which is an odd thing to imagine, but let's say it was, then you would have to do something called a weighted linear regression, and you would treat your error differently. Usually pretty good to make these assumptions for most of the analysis problems that you'll face. 
Thanks so much. See you next time.